Why I try to commit suicide. Video one. Hey y'all, I am Victor E and I help provide insight to empower. And today I wanted to share uh, the story, the reasons that led up to and fed into my suicide attempt back in 2014. Uh, so a little bit of backstory uh, and just jumping into like the reasoning behind why I felt like that was the only option uh, was because that's what I believed in my heart. That's what I like believed was the best way to love myself uh, and and to love those around me. Uh, so if you haven't watched any of my other videos, um, I grew up very much a child of neglect, a child of uh, emotionally unintelligent and unavailable, un unavailable parents. Um, and it's why I have dedicated so much of my time, so much of my life, my 32 years so far um, into psychology, into, uh, into trauma research, into healing modalities, into building emotional intelligence is because that's something that I felt was sorely needed growing up. Uh, getting into the beliefs that led to that feeling like the only option was, it's important to note uh, what a really good trauma researcher I follow, Mastin Kip, uh, has dubbed uh, was it original incidents or OIs or what other people may call activating events. And so these are experiences uh, that we had in formative years, developmental years, is like zero to seven ish uh, and definitely still in adolescence and adulthood uh, but they're you know original incidents or originating incidents uh, activating events that help us form beliefs about how best to navigate the world and beliefs being kind of you know algorithms if you're into that uh, nomenclature or phrasing uh, they're kind of running in the background of all of our minds and they help us to kind of like make snap decisions so that we don't have to think about every single little thing that comes our way uh, so one of the beliefs that I formed that my parents helped me to come to in this life was that what I had to say and my perspective um, was not welcome. It was not worth, it was not worthy of time and attention. So the way this would happen is that I would have um, uh, like, a, like a very true um, idea or expression or thought that, that I would verbalize and my dad would just like talk over me because he didn't want to hear it. Um, and I took that to mean that what I had to say was unimportant, especially when it came from like the, the truest part of me. And there were just numerous uh, incidents like this. Uh, and that's just kind of like, that's something that, that I internalized, I took personally, uh, instead of just seeing that my dad, uh, it was something that my dad was not comfortable or ready or open to hearing. I took it to mean it's just not like, it's just not worth time and attention from the one of the people that I care about the most. So when it came to my mom with her schizophrenia and depression and being mentally and emotionally checked out, when I had, again, that, that something to say, uh, it would be ignored by her. So I took that also to mean uh, that what I, that my needs uh, were not worthy of being met. Something that I took personally. 
uh, because I just didn't know any, any better at the time. Uh, so on the one hand, for like for my dad, there are my wants, like wanting to be heard, and on my mom's side, it was like needing, having basic necessities, like food, uh, different forms of uh, nourishment, uh, of unconditional love, of being seen, being heard, these very uh, important things to, to us as humans as like a very community based species. Um, there's this African, I believe it's an African proverb of like, the child who does not feel the love and warmth of his village, of his tribe, will feel it through like the warmth of burning it down is a, a, me paraphrasing. Um, but it just speaks so much, so 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 deeply to how like those of us who feel unloved tend to learn that we're not worthy of love, and so that how that creates this spiral of of shame, of depression, of anger. Uh, a lot of the time, and how we like how we feel like that's the only way to create boundaries or or express ourselves, uh, working under the automatic, under the assumption that, um, hi buddy, uh, working under the assumption that people don't or won't hear us out or see us for who we really are. So we have to like put on this mask. Uh, so it, it was like having those beliefs incepted, instilled in me at such a young age gave me the, the personality that I would work with in the coming years. And from there, I would create from that perspective, from that perspective of not feeling worthy, uh, being heard, being seen, being loved unconditionally, having being able to have wants and needs, like feeling like I couldn't have wants and needs because they would automatically be ignored, you know? Uh, so I mean, going through, and like, so I grew up in like the south, southwest side of Chicago, volatile area, a lot of people like me, um, hood adjacent, as I like to say, uh, and going into like this high school, that divided, it was like right in between the two gang neighborhoods. So it was like, it was a hotbed for, for fights pretty much daily. Um, and then from there going into the uh, Marine infantry. So just going from one chaotic place to another, to another and feeling like I couldn't express or ask for help or feel supported uh, in dealing, learning to manage all of this pent up hurt, all this pent up love too. I feel like, I, I felt like uh, my love wasn't worthy of being received or that I wasn't worthy of receiving love from those uh, originating incidents and activating events. Uh, so it was just one, you know, traumatic environment to the next um, with a lot of you know, like sprinkles of, of uh, people who would help me, who would help plant the seeds for how to orient uh, my inner compass uh, in, into like searching uh, for the tools and the teachers who would help me learn how to, how to love myself, how to love myself uh, in order to be of service to others, in order to better love others. So I'm not, you know, working from a place of fear and assuming rejection. Um, so that's where, like, that's more or less where I'm at now. And why I tried to commit suicide was just, I didn't feel like I had anyone to support me through my darkest time. I felt like I was completely alone. And 
So there's the feeling that I didn't deserve to be seen or heard or loved unconditionally. And having a belief gave me certainty in a really in a really fucked up way. It was like, okay, I don't know what else is out there. I don't know what else is true. And I don't feel safe enough to explore or to take risks because I don't feel like I have a, a good, strong support system. Um, therefore, I have to cling on to what I know is certain. And what I know is certain is that, you know, what I just mentioned is that I don't deserve to be loved. I don't deserve to be seen, heard, uh, unconditionally loved and supported. So even if there were people who could provide those things, I kind of have these blinders on, these subconscious like spiritual blinders um and it culminated into like working at this rock climbing gym uh whose shirt i'm actually wearing right now um and just feeling like the lowest of the low working there like um i was like one of the first hired there's like a lot of stories about like why i felt i deserved to be seen and heard and yet feeling like I was treated in like a subhuman way. Um, and if we're, if we're still on originating incidents, there are a lot of times traveling to and from Mexico where in formative years, like around five, six, seven, eight, maybe even like younger, um, you know, people, hotels wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, you know, service us. We couldn't stay there. Uh, I remember a Denny's, a Steak and Shake specifically, and just other places uh, we couldn't go to because they wouldn't serve us. It was in the in the early 90s, right? So, <laughs> you know, like nowadays they would be put on social media and these places are shamed and the manager's fired or whatever. Uh, but back then it was normal to just not serve people of color. Uh, I remember one time uh, everybody in the car, my three older sisters, my mom, my dad, uh, they handed me the phone to call a holiday in because I had the least accent um, and therefore would be the least likely to be rejected um, based on race, right? Because they can't hear or make out the accents of my sisters and, and parents. Um, and sure enough, like it was, it was so weird because like as soon as uh. I gave them my name, my first name, and they're like, okay, uh, last name. They're like checking us in already, and I give them my my last name, like uh, Enriquez, and they're like, oh, uh, okay, uh, no, our, our, we're all booked up, no vacancy, uh, and you know, sure enough, we, we drive by that same hotel like five minutes later, vacancy. Um, right outside on the on the sign so already from that age working from the belief that white people are superior and people of color are inherently inferior and working at this rock climbing gym which is like you know how we say in the POC community that's white people shit to be doing but there I was you know trying to be uh, accepted and looking for validation from people are, that didn't really give a shit about me. There were some people there that definitely did. Um, but it's, it's strange the things that we have to go through on our own. We're never alone, but there are definitely some things I've come to see firsthand we have to go through alone because it, it's shaping us into who we are and it definitely does as like begrudging as I am to say this uh, it definitely does help and did help to go through that like suicide attempt alone because under those under that paradigm that I was in getting support and love especially unconditionally was a lot more like a drug than it was anything else, right? Coming from a fear-based perspective, it was like, okay, I need to get love and you like, I need to get it 
and then distance. Um, right, it, it touches on uh, avoidant or not? Well, like av avoidant, but also just uh, um, it touches on attachment theory and attachment styles. Um, how I had like an anxious avoidant one, right? Like I don't need love, but I definitely want it, and then I got it, and now I'm like so fucking freaking out. Uh, versus just being secure, like having that open door with love, like it can come in. I appreciate it while it's here, uh, but I'm not gonna force it to stay. It can go whenever it needs to. I trust that more is on the way. Secure attachments. Um, and it's definitely not something that I had to learn on my own and then implement as I was going. But why I tried to commit suicide was just feeling, believing that I didn't deserve to be supported, didn't deserve to be seen, didn't deserve to be loved unconditionally, didn't deserve to have wants and needs. So if this, if this is something that you're struggling with or that you know somebody is or has struggled with, it definitely helps to find out, explore, discover, make space for uh, incidents in one's life that helped us to shape the belief that we don't deserve to be loved or that we don't deserve to be seen or that unconditional love is unavailable. As soon as we start to believe, even though it's not there, believe that it is at least possible to, to find it, to find someone, to find the information that can help us learn it. That's when, call it your spirit, call it your subconscious, it starts to orient you and your awareness uh, to the right information. Suddenly the idea comes into Google certain things and now thanks to cookies and fucking you know, like data, data mining, data collecting. As soon as you research one thing, it's like, oh, this might also help. Um, and now there's like scientific evidence behind it called like the, it's called the reticular activating system. Um, and like just a quick anecdote is like this comedian has this joke, I forget what comedian, but it's like, uh, I think it was Bill Burr actually. Um, it talks about like, I never knew how many mattress stores there were until I needed a mattress. And as soon as I bought a mattress, I found a mattress, I just stopped seeing all these mattress stores. Uh, but it, it speaks to, you know, the law of attraction or manifestation or the reticular activating system. That is when we get clear on what we want and what we need, suddenly our brain, our subconscious, our spirit, our guides, uh, God, whatever you want to call it, is helping us to find it, helping us to create the reality that we truly believe. But first, it's just a matter of believing that it's possible to get what we want and what we need. So I hope that answers the question that nobody asked why I try to commit suicide. hope this helps uh, like subscribe share mm. I think that's it if there's anything else I'll make another video uh, if you have any questions or comments definitely drop them below uh, love you peace